Long Discourses Chapter on the Virtues 3 To Ambatta A young Brahmin's rudeness and an old one's faith Thus have I heard The Blessed One, when once on a tour through the Kosala country with a great company of the brethren With about five hundred brethren, arrived at a Brahmin village in Kosala named Ikanankala, and while there he stayed in the Ikanankala wood now at that time the Brahmin Pakharasati was dwelling at Ukatha, a spot teeming with life, with much grassland and woodland and corn, on a royal domain. Granted him by King Pasenadi of Kosala as a royal gift, with power over it as if he were the king. Now the Brahmin Pakharasati heard the news. They say that the same Agodama, of the Sakya clan, who went out from a Sakya family to adopt the religious life, has now arrived with a great company of the brethren of his order at Ikanankala and is staying there in the Ikanankala wood. Now regarding that venerable Gotama, such is the high reputation that has been noised abroad. That blessed one is an Araha, a fully awakened one, abounding in wisdom and goodness, happy, with knowledge of the worlds. Unsurpassed as a guide to mortals willing to be led, a teacher for gods and men, a blessed one, a Buddha. He by himself, thoroughly knows and sees, as it were. Face to face this universe including the worlds above of the gods, the Brahmas, and the Maras, and the world below with its recluses and Brahmans, its princes and peoples and having known it, he makes his knowledge known to others. The truth, lovely in its origin, lovely in its progress, lovely in its consummation, doth he proclaim, both in the spirit and in the letter. The higher life doth he make known, in all its fullness and in all its purity. And good is it to pay visits to Arahas like that. Now at that time a young Brahmin, an Ambatha, was a pupil under Pakharasati the Brahmin. And he was a repeater, of the sacred words, knowing the mystic verses by heart, one who had mastered the three Vedas, with the indices, the ritual, the phonology, and the exegesis, as a fourth, and the legends as a fifth learned in the idioms and the grammar, versed in Lokayata sophistry, and in the theory of the signs on the body of a great man so recognized an authority in the system of the threefold Vedic knowledge as expounded by his master, that he could say of him, what I know that you know, and what you know that I know. And Pakharasati told Ambatha the news, and said, Come now, dear Ambatha, go to the same Agodama and find out whether the reputation so noised abroad regarding him is in accord with the facts or not, whether the same Agodama is such as they say or not. But how, sir, shall I know whether that is so or not? There have been handed down, Ambatha, in our mystic verses 32 bodily signs of a great man signs which, if a man has, he will become one of two things, and no other. If he dwells at home he will become a sovereign of the world, a righteous king, bearing rule even to the shores of the four great oceans, a conqueror, the protector of his people, possessor of the seven royal treasures. And these are the seven treasures that he has the wheel, the elephant, the horse, the gem, the woman, the treasurer, and the advisor as a seventh. And he has more than a thousand sons, heroes, mighty in frame, beating down the armies of the foe and he dwells in complete ascendancy over the wide earth from sea to sea, ruling it in righteousness without the need of baton or of sword. But if he go forth from the household life into the houseless state, then he will become a Buddha who removes the veil from the eyes of the world. Now I, Ambatha, am a giver of the mystic verses, you have received them from me. Very good, sir, said Ambatha in reply, and rising from his seat and paying reverence to Pakharasati. He mounted a chariot drawn by mares, and proceeded, with a retinue of young Brahmans, to the Ikanankala wood. And when he had gone on in the chariot as far as the road was practicable for vehicles, he got down, and went on, into the park, on foot. Now at that time a number of the brethren were walking up and down in the open air. And Ambatha went up to them, and said, Where may the venerable Gotama be lodging now? We have come hither to call upon him. Then the brethren thought, This young Brahmin Ambatha is of distinguished family, and a pupil of the distinguished Brahmin Pakharasati. 
the blessed one will not find it difficult to hold conversation with such. And they said to Ambattha, There, Ambattha, is his lodging, where the door is shut, go quietly up and enter the porch gently, and give a cough, and knock on the crossbar. The blessed one will open the door for you. Then Ambattha did so. And the blessed one opened the door, and Ambattha entered in. And the other young Brahmans also went in. And they exchanged with the Blessed One the greetings and compliments of politeness and courtesy, and took their seats. But Ambattha, walking about, said something or other of a civil kind in an offhand way, fidgeting about the while, or standing up, to the Blessed One sitting there. And the Blessed One said to him, Is that the way, Ambattha, that you would hold converse with aged teachers, and teachers of your teachers well stricken in years, as you now do? moving about the while or standing, with me thus seated? Certainly not, Gotama. It is proper to speak with a Brahman as one goes along only when the Brahman himself is walking, and standing to a Brahman who stands, and seated to a Brahman who has taken his seat, or reclining to a Brahman who reclines. But with shavelings, sham friars, menial black fellows, the offscoring of our kinsmen's heels with them I would talk as I now do to you. But you must have been wanting something, Ambattha, when you came here. Turn your thoughts rather to the object you had in view when you came. This young Brahmin Ambattha is ill-bred, though he prides himself on his culture. What can this come from except from want of training? Then Ambattha was displeased and angry with the Blessed One at being called rude. And at the thought that the Blessed One was vexed with him, he said, scoffing, jeering, and sneering at the Blessed One. Rough is the Sakya breed of yours, Gotama, and rude. Touchy is the Sakya breed of yours and violent. Menials, mere menials, they neither venerate, nor value, nor esteem, nor give gifts to, nor pay honor to Brahmans. That, Gotama, is neither fitting, nor is it seemly. Thus did the young Brahmin Ambattha for the first time charge the Sakyas with being menials. But in what then, Ambattha, have the Sakyas given you offense? Once, Gotama, I had to go to Kapalavatthu on some business or other of Pakharasades, and went into the Sakyas Congress Hall. Now at that time there were a number of Sakyas, old and young, seated in the hall on grand seats, making merry and joking together, nudging one another with their fingers. And for a truth, methinks, it was I myself that was the subject of their jokes. And not one of them even offered me a seat. That, Gotama, is neither fitting, nor is it seemly, that the Sakyas, menials as they are, mere menials, should neither venerate, nor value, nor esteem, nor give gifts to, nor pay honor to Brahmans. Thus did the young Brahmin Ambattha for the second time charge the Sakyas with being menials. Why a quail, Ambattha, little hen bird though she be, can say what she likes in her own nest. And there the Sakyas are at their own home, in Kapalavatthu. It is not fitting for you to take offense at so trifling a thing. There are these four grades, Gotama the nobles, the Brahmans, the tradesfolk, and the work people. And of these four, three the nobles, the tradesfolk, and the work people are, verily, but attendants on the Brahmans. So, Gotama, that is neither fitting, nor is it seemly, that the Sakyas, menials as they are, mere menials, should neither venerate, nor value, nor esteem, nor give gifts to, nor pay honor to the Brahmans. Thus did the young Brahman Ambattha for the third time charge the Sakyas with being menials. Then the Blessed One thought thus, this Ambattha is very set on humbling the Sakyas with his charge of servile origin. What if I were to ask him as to his own lineage? And he said to him, And what family do you then, Ambattha, belong to? I am a Kayana. Yes, but if one were to follow up your ancient name and lineage, Ambattha, on the father's and the mother's side, it would appear that the Sakyas were once your masters and that you are the offspring of one of their slave girls. But the Sakyas trace their line back to Okaka the king. Long ago, Ambattha, 
King Okaka, wanting to divert the succession in favor or the son of his favorite queen. Banished his elder children Okamuka, Karanda, Hatthanika, and Sinipura from the land. And being thus banished they took up their dwelling on the slopes of the Himalaya, on the borders of a lake where a mighty oak tree grew. And through fear of injuring the purity of their line they intermarried with their sisters. Now Okaka the king asked the ministers at his court, Where, sirs, are the children now? There is a spot, sire, on the slopes of the Himalaya, on the borders of a lake, where there grows a mighty oak, Sako. There do they dwell. And lest they should injure the purity of their line they have married their own, Sakahi, sisters. Then did Okaka the king burst forth in admiration, Hearts of Oak, Sakya, are those young fellows. Right well they hold their own, Paramasakya. That is the reason, Ambatha, why they are known as Sakyas. Now Okaka had a slave girl called Dissa. She gave birth to a black baby. And no sooner was it born than the little black thing said, Wash me, mother. Bathe me, mother. Set me free, mother, of this dirt. So shall I be of use to you. Now just as now, Ambatha, people call devils devils, so then they called devils black fellows, he. And they said, this fellow spoke as soon as he was born. This a black thing, Kaha, that is born, a devil has been born. And that is the origin, Ambatha, of the Kanhayanas s. He was the ancestor of the Kanhayanas. And thus is it, Ambatha, that if one were to follow up your ancient name and lineage, on the father's and on the mother's side, it would appear that the Sakyas were once your masters, and that you are the offspring of one of their slave girls. When he had thus spoken the young Brahman said to the Blessed One, Let not the Venerable Gotama humble Ambatha too sternly with this reproach of being descended from a slave girl. He is well born, Gotama, and of good family, he is versed in the sacred hymns, an able reciter, a learned man. And he is able to give answer to the Venerable Gotama in these matters. Then the Blessed One said to them, quite so. If you thought otherwise, then it would be for you to carry on our discussion further. But as you think so, let Ambatha himself speak. We do think so, and we will hold our peace. Ambatha is able to give answer to the Venerable Gotama in these matters. Then the Blessed One said to Ambatha the Brahman, then this further question arises, Ambatha, a very reasonable one which, even though unwillingly, you should answer. If you do not give a clear reply, or go off upon another issue, or remain silent, or go away, then your head will split in pieces on the spot. What have you heard, when Brahmans old and well stricken in years, teachers of yours or their teachers, were talking together? As to whence the Kanhayanas draw their origin, and who the ancestor was to whom they trace themselves back. And when he had thus spoken Ambatha remained silent and the Blessed One asked the same question again. And still Ambatha remained silent. Then the Blessed One said to him, You had better answer, now, Ambatha. This is no time for you to hold your peace. For whosoever, Ambatha, does not, even up to the third time of asking, answer a reasonable question put by a Tathagata, by one who has won the truth, his head splits into pieces on the spot. Now at that time the spirit who bears the thunderbolt stood over above Ambatha in the sky with a mighty mass of iron. All fiery, dazzling, and aglow, with the intention, if he did not answer, there and then to split his head in pieces. And the Blessed One perceived the spirit bearing the thunderbolt, and so did Ambatha the Brahman. And Ambatha on becoming aware of it, terrified, startled, and agitated, seeking safety and protection and help from the Blessed One, crouched down beside him in awe, and said. What was it the Blessed One said? Say it once again. What do you think, Ambatha? What have you heard, when Brahmans old and well stricken in years, teachers of yours or their teachers, were talking together? As to whence the Kanhayanas draw their origin, and who the ancestor was to whom they trace themselves back. Just so, Gotama, 
did I hear, even as the Venerable Gotama hath said. That is the origin of the Kanhayanas, and that the ancestor to whom they trace themselves back. And when he had thus spoken the young Brahmans fell into tumult and uproar and turmoil, and said, Low-born, they say, is Ambattha the Brahman. His family, they say, is not of good standing, they say he is descended from a slave girl. And the Sakyas were his masters. We did not suppose that the same Agotama, whose words are righteousness itself, was not a man to be trusted. And the Blessed One thought, they go too far, these Brahmans, in their depreciation of Ambattha as the offspring of a slave girl. Let me set him free from their reproach. And he said to them, Be not too severe in disparaging Ambattha the Brahman on the ground of his descent. That Kaha became a mighty seer. He went into the Deccan, there he learned mystic verses, and returning to Okaka the king, he demanded his daughter Mata Arupai in marriage. To him the king in answer said, Who forsooth is this fellow, who son of my slave girl as he is asks for my daughter in marriage, and, angry and displeased, he fitted an arrow to his bow. But neither could he let the arrow fly, nor could he take it off the string again. Then the ministers and courtiers went to Kaha the seer, and said, Let the king go safe, sir, let the king go safe. The king shall suffer no harm. But should he shoot the arrow downwards, then would the earth dry up as far as his realm extends. Let the king, sir, go safe, and the country too. The king shall suffer no harm, nor his land. But should he shoot the arrow upwards, the god would not reign for seven years as far as his realm extends. Let the king, sir, go safe, and the country too, and let the god reign. The king shall suffer no harm, nor the land either, and the god shall reign. But let the king aim the arrow at his eldest son. The prince shall suffer no harm, not a hair of him shall be touched. Then, O Brahmans, the ministers told this to Okaka, and said, Let the king aim at his eldest son. He will suffer neither harm nor terror. And the king did so, and no harm was done. But the king, terrified at the lesson given him, gave the man his daughter Mata Arupai to wife. You should not, O Brahmans, be too severe to disparage Ambattha in the matter of his slave girl and stress. That Kaha was a mighty seer. Then the Blessed One said to Ambattha, What think you, Ambattha? Suppose a young Kshatriya should have connection with a Brahman maiden, and from their intercourse a son should be born. Now would the son thus come to the Brahman maiden through the Kshatriya youth receive a seat and water, as tokens of respect, from the Brahmans? Yes, he would, Gotama. But would the Brahmans allow him to partake of the feast offered to the dead, or of the food boiled in milk, or of the offerings to the gods, or of food sent as a present? Yes, they would, Gotama. But would the Brahmans teach him their verses or not? They would. Gotama. But would he be shut off, or not, from their women? He would not be shut off. But would the Kshatriyas allow him to receive the consecration ceremony of a Kshatriya? Certainly not, Gotama. Why not that? Because he is not of pure descent on the mother's side. Then what think you, Ambattha? Suppose a Brahmin youth should have connection with a Kshatriya maiden, and from their intercourse a son should be born. Now would the son thus come to the Kshatriya maiden through the Brahman youth receive a seat and water, as tokens of respect, from the Brahmans? Yes, he would, Gotama. But would the Brahmans allow him to partake of the feast offered to the dead, or of food boiled in milk, or of an offering to the gods, or of food sent as a present? Yes, they would, Gotama. But would the Brahmans teach him their verses or not? They would, Gotama. But would he be shut off, or not, from their women? He would not, Gotama. But would the Kshatriyas allow him to receive the consecration ceremony of a Kshatriya? Certainly not, Gotama. Why not that? Because he is not of pure descent on the father's side. Then, Ambattha, whether one compares women with women, or men with men, 
the Kshatriyas are higher and the Brahmans inferior. And what think you, Ambatta? Suppose the Brahmans, for some offense or other, were to outlaw a Brahmin by shaving him and pouring ashes over his head, were to banish him from the land or from the township. Would he be offered a seat or water among the Brahmans? Certainly not, Gotama. Or would the Brahmans allow him to partake of the food offered to the dead, or of the food boiled in milk, or of the offerings to the gods, or of food sent as a present? Certainly not, Gotama. Or would the Brahmans teach him their verses or not? Certainly not, Gotama. And would he be shut off, or not, from their women? He would be shut off. But what think you, Ambatha? If the Kshatriyas had in the same way outlawed a Kshatriya, and banished him from the land or the township, would he, among the Brahmans, be offered water and a seed? Yes, he would, Gotama. And would he be allowed to partake of the food offered to the dead, or of the food boiled in milk, or of the offerings to the gods, or of food sent as a present? He would, Gotama. And would the Brahmans teach him their verses? They would, Gotama. And would he be shut off, or not, from their women? He would not, Gotama. But thereby, Ambatha, the Kshatriya would have fallen into the deepest degradation, shaven as to his head, cut dead with the ash basket, banished from land and township. So that, even when a Kshatriya has fallen into the deepest degradation, still it holds good that the Kshatriyas are higher, and the Brahmans inferior. Moreover it was one of the Brahma gods, Sanakumara, who uttered this stanza. The Kshatriya is the best of those among this folk, who put their trust in lineage. But he who is perfect in wisdom and righteousness, he is the best among gods and men. Now this stanza, Ambatha, was well sung and not ill sung by the Brahma Sanakumara, well said and not ill said, full of meaning and not void thereof. And I too approve it. I also, Ambatha, say. The Kshatriya is the best of those among this folk who put their trust in lineage. But he who is perfect in wisdom and righteousness, he is the best among gods and men. Here ends the first portion for recitation. Chapter 2 But what, Gotama, is the righteousness, and what the wisdom spoken of in that verse? In the supreme perfection in wisdom and righteousness, Ambatha, there is no reference to the question either of birth, or of lineage, or of the pride which says, You are held as worthy as I. Or you are not held as worthy as I. It is where the talk is of marrying, or of giving in marriage, that reference is made to such things as that. For whosoever, Ambatha, are in bondage to the notions of birth or of lineage, or to the pride of social position, or of connection by marriage, they are far from the best wisdom and righteousness. It is only by having got rid of all such bondage that one can realize for himself that supreme perfection in wisdom and in conduct. But what, Gotama, is that conduct, and what that wisdom? The next section in the Pali text is greatly abbreviated. The following is a fully expanded version, based on the text of DN2, Samanaphala Sutta as translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Note that it is not always possible to determine exactly how the expansion should be done. Herein, Ambatha, a Tathagata arises in the world, a worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished. A knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened and exalted. Having realized by his own direct knowledge this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its rulers, and people, he makes it known to others. He teaches the dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, possessing meaning and phrasing, he reveals the holy life that is fully complete and purified. A householder, or a householder's son, or one born into some other family, hears the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he gains faith in the Tathagata. Endowed with such faith, he reflects. The household life is crowded, a path of dust. Going forth is like the open air. 
it is not easy for one dwelling at home to lead the perfectly complete, perfectly purified holy life, bright as a polished conch. Let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes, and go forth from home to homelessness. After some time he abandons his accumulation of wealth, be it large or small, he abandons his circle of relatives, be it large or small. He shaves off his hair and beard, puts on saffron robes, and goes forth from home to homelessness. When he has thus gone forth, he lives restrained by the restraint of the Padamakha, possessed of proper behavior and resort. Having taken up the rules of training, he trains himself in them, seeing danger in the slightest faults. He comes to be endowed with wholesome bodily and verbal action, his livelihood is purified, and he is possessed of conduct. He guards the doors of his sense faculties, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, and is content. The small section on moral discipline. And how, Ambattha, is the bhikkhu possessed of moral discipline? Herein, Ambattha, having abandoned the destruction of life, the bhikkhu abstains from the destruction of life. He has laid down the rod and weapon and dwells conscientious, full of kindness, sympathetic for the welfare of all living beings. This pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned taking what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Accepting and expecting only what is given, he lives in honesty with a pure mind. This too pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned in celibacy, he leads the holy life of celibacy. He dwells aloof and abstains from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. This too pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned false speech, he abstains from falsehood. He speaks only the truth, he lives devoted to truth, trustworthy and reliable, he does not deceive anyone in the world. This too pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned slander, he abstains from slander. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide others from the people here. Nor does he repeat here what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these from the people there. Thus he is a reconciler of those who are divided and a promoter of friendships. Rejoicing, delighting, and exulting in concord, he speaks only words that are conducive to concord. This too pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks only such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, endearing, going to the heart, polite, amiable and agreeable to the many folk. This too pertains to his conduct. Having abandoned idle chatter, he abstains from idle chatter. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is factual and beneficial, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. His words are worth treasuring, they are timely, backed by reasons, measured, and connected with the good. This too pertains to his conduct. He abstains from damaging seed and plant life. He eats only in one part of the day, refraining from food at night and from eating at improper times. He abstains from dancing, singing, instrumental music, and from witnessing unsuitable shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, embellishing himself with scents, and beautifying himself with unguents. He abstains from high and luxurious beds and seats. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting uncooked grain, raw meat, women and girls, male and female slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and swine, elephants, cattle, horses and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and lands. He abstains from running messages and errands. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from dealing with false weights, false metals and false measures. He abstains from the crooked ways of bribery, deception, and fraud. He abstains from mutilating, executing, imprisoning, robbery, plunder, and violence. This too pertains to his conduct. The Intermediate Section on Moral Discipline Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, continually cause damage to seed and plant life to plants propagated from roots, stems, joints, buds, and seeds he abstains from damaging seed and plant life. 
this too pertains to his conduct. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of stored up goods. Such as stored up food, drinks, garments, vehicles, bedding, scents, and comestibles. He abstains from the use of stored up goods. This too pertains to his conduct. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, attend unsuitable shows, such as shows featuring dancing, singing, or instrumental music, theatrical performances, narrations of legends music played by hand clapping, cymbals, and drums, picture houses, acrobatic performances, combats of elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, goats, rams, cocks and quails, stick fights, boxing, and wrestling, sham fights, roll calls, battle arrays, and regimental reviews. He abstains from attending such unsuitable shows. This too pertains to his conduct. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, indulge in the following games and recreations. Ahapada, a game played on an 8-row chessboard. Dasipada, a game played on a 10-row chessboard. Akhaza, played by imagining a board in the air. Pariharapatha, hopscotch, a diagram is drawn on the ground and one has to jump in the allowable spaces avoiding the lines. Santika, spillikins, assembling the pieces in a pile, removing and returning them without disturbing the pile. Kalika, dice games. Gaika, hitting a short stick with a long stick. Salakahatha, a game played by dipping the hand in paint or dye, striking the ground or a wall, and requiring the participants to show the figure of an elephant, a horse etc. Akha, ball games. Pagakra, blowing through toy pipes made of leaves. Vakaka, plowing with miniature plows. Mokhasika, turning somersaults. Sigulika, playing with paper windmills. Pataka, playing with toy measures. Radhaka, playing with toy chariots. Donaka, playing with toy bows. Akharika, guessing at letters written in the air or on one's back. Mainsika, guessing others' thoughts. Yathavahya, games involving mimicry of deformities. He abstains from such games that are a basis for negligence. This too pertains to his conduct. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of high and luxurious beds and seats, such as spacious couches, thrones with animal figures carved on the supports, long-haired coverlets, multicolored patchwork coverlets, white woolen coverlets, woolen coverlets embroidered with flowers, quilts stuffed with cotton, woolen coverlets embroidered with animal figures, woolen coverlets with hair on both sides or on one side, bedspreads embroidered with gems, Silk coverlets. Dance hall carpets. Elephant, horse, or chariot rugs. Rugs of antelope skins. Choice spreads made of cuddly deer hides. Spreads with red awnings overhead. Couches with red cushions for head and feet. He abstains from the use of such high and luxurious beds and seats. This too pertains to his conduct. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of such devices for embellishing and beautifying themselves as the following. Rubbing scented powders into the body massaging with oils, bathing in perfumed water. Kneading the limbs, mirrors, ointments, garlands. Scents, unguents, face powders, makeup. Bracelets, headbands, decorated walking stick. 